Welcome into another installment of the official Jets podcast. Eric Allen here at One Jets Drive, joined by my friend, colleague, the one, the one, the one and only Brian Baldinger. Baldy, yeah, yeah. what's the word, man? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. You know, we're uh, we're counting down the days to this draft, and you know, I mean, I know we've had a solar eclipse, <laughs> and I know we've crowned a women's and a men's college basketball championship. We have. But in my world, in my little bubble, it's about the draft. So that's what I've been really putting my attention into. What were your draft weekend memories coming out of Duke? <laughs> well, it was I, I came out like, you know, a century ago. So 1982. Yep. Just to give you a perspective, it wasn't televised. It wasn't on radio. It wasn't, you couldn't find it anywhere. You had to read about it in the paper the next day. So my year, 1982, like, my brother got drafted in the 10th round. I found that out. Giants drafted him in the 10th round. And, you know, I was unsigned. I mean, nobody called. We had 12 rounds of the draft. Nobody drafted me. So first phone call I got after the draft was by the Cowboys the day after. And uh guy was out there, you know, the equipment manager was out there trying to sign me, Buck Buchanan. Um, yeah, they thought so highly of me, they sent the equipment manager to try to sign me. And uh, we negotiated a contract in my uh, my living room while I was getting ready for a German exam. Are you serious? Yeah. Well, huh? yeah, I got him. I got Did him you have any expectations? You said the ra- uh, draft was twelve rounds at the twelve time? rounds back yeah. then. I thought I might. I was a starter for two years at Duke. I was a, like uh, I was a transfer. I played tight end my first year, got to the offensive line, um, and started my last two years. So I thought I had a, a, a chance. And then when I, my brother, who's a year younger than me. Um, got drafted in the 10th round. I thought, well, ain't this a son of a gun? Like, this lazy bum got drafted in the 10th round, and I and I got to, like, try and sign a free agent contract. But it all worked out. But I, nobody really knew. You know, like, we didn't – I didn't have a lot of contact. A lot of teams worked me out. Did you have an agent? I did not have an agent. Okay. No, no agent. The Canadian Football League was trying to sign me. I went for a workout with them. I made the uh, – what Montreal Alouettes? No, it was no, it was like Ontario <laughs> Hamilcats or one of those teams. I forget. Um, one of those teams up there uh, wanted to sign me. They offered me a contract off of a workout, but um, but what's your reference point as far as what's a good contract here as an undrafted free agent? You are taking anything they're going to give you, or how did you negotiate that? Well, I had a I had a a beat up car in the parking lot that didn't have any brakes. <laughs> So I felt like I needed enough money to fix the brakes in my car to drive it home. Yeah. It was a Plymouth Fury, and uh, there was no Fury in the car. Like, it was just, <laughs> I wasn't driving it. Break. So they offered me $500 in a three-year deal, $32,000, $36,000, all right? And um, I was okay with the, with the money, um, but I, I, I needed to get the signing bonus up. So I got, I got the Cowboys to, to sign me to a $1,200 signing bonus. 1200 which we got my brakes fixed, put a little cash in my pocket, um, and I was able to get home, get home uh, after after graduation. But it wasn't necessarily the Fast and the Furious after that. <laughs> no. <laughs> you didn't I, have the brakes. Well, yeah, yeah, I got the brakes, <laughs> so uh, that was good. And then what I didn't know, though, when they signed me was they also signed 109 other free agents in addition to the 15 draft picks they the had. The Cowboys they signed 109. Rookies. They signed 110. I was the 110th. They signed 110 free agents. That's what they used to do every year. Like, they just would sign a glut of free agents, and then basically after every two days practice, the rookies would just uh, have a scrimmage, and that was a chance to kind of shine or whatever. So, you know, there was 110 free agents, 125 rookies. And six of us ended up making it. I was the one free agent that made it my rookie year out of the 110. Was there any thought of not playing professional football? No I mean, thought. Duke no thought education's not too bad. No, I had a I had a good job. I, I went for this job offer in Chicago, and I got it. And they actually, my first year salary at this company um, was actually more money than the Cowboys were paying me. Really? Could have made more money going to work for this uh, as a salesperson for this Pretty big company, a national company. And I'd gotten the job. I interviewed. I beat out, you know, a lot of the, the candidates. But, um, you know, I wanted to – I had this friend of mine that actually played for the Jets, uh, Kurt Sohn, yep. before your time, EA. He played <laughs> – we both played at Nassau Community College right in Garden City, not far from where the Jets used to 
practice at Hofstra. over there at Hofstra. Weeby Bank Hall. Yeah, Weeby Bank Hall. And uh, Kurt Sohn was my teammate at Nassau. He, was, he went to Fordham, and then he signed as a free agent with the Jets and made it. He made it as a returner, third down specialist, whatever. He played seven or eight years. And Kurt told me when I was at junior college, he goes, you know, if you play high school football, you might as well try to play college football. And if you play college football, you might as well try to play pro football. And that's the first time I really thought about pro football. And, I, and then I, I always believed that. I still, I still say it to today. And so I, I played college and, you know, junior college, Duke, all this stuff. And I just, I didn't really care about the money. I felt like if I could save $20,000, that would be enough to get myself, you know, jump started in any right. career. So, I, you know, my goal was to play professional football at least for one year. And if I could do that, I could say that I did it, save a little bit of money, and then get my life started. You played more than a decade, though. I played 12. Yep. Played 12, yeah. But, you know, this time of the year is interesting because— uh, That's what I was going to ask you. Do you have a soft spot in your heart for those guys who oh, are not yeah. going to be drafted? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, guy, the undrafted yeah. players, I always, you know, reach out to them because uh, I know it's not the easiest course. But it's also— the, the, you never take the free agent out of a guy. You know, once he makes it as a free agent, he's used to seeing the, the fresh crop coming in every year. He's used to being trying to run out of the locker room. And I, I felt that. I felt that after I made it my rookie year. You know, they, they came back the next year, second round, drafted an offensive tackle, drafted a bunch of guys. And I felt like, okay, this is going to be what every year is. They're going to try to replace you. Right. And so you just, like, you gear up for it, get your game face on, you go to camp, and you, you just go compete. Every year, and you beat you know the next guys out. Jets fans are so excited about the draft, and rightfully so. How do the veterans take it in? Because, like you're mentioning, this is a business. This is a profession. While it sounds good on paper that some of these guys are going to come in and help our team win games, these guys are coming to take my job. Yeah, well, I mean, look, the, the veterans they sign, especially on the offensive line, you know, Tyron Smith, Morgan Moses, John Simpson. I mean, John Simpson was a young player. He had one full year of starting Yeah, 26, yep. Yeah, so he's young. But, you know, Tyron and Morgan, I mean, they're here to be the starters. Now, they can't, you know, they drafted Carter Warren last year, Max Mitchell the year before. I mean, those are fourth-round picks. Um, you know, you want to keep developing those guys. But, you know, you get drafted in the offense line. I don't care if you're in the first round or if you're in the seventh round. I mean, your goal is to come in and compete and show them that you belong, that you're coachable, that uh, you know you have a professional approach, you know, being ready every day, understanding your assignments, knowing the playbook, like coming in and and look if it's if it's because you can't make because if it's a numbers game, and you put your resume out there for somebody else. Yeah. But you come in here. I don't care what round you get drafted or what your name is. You have to come in here to compete. And who's to say that? Let's just say the Jets draft an offensive tackle with a 10th pick. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Um, I've heard people say, well, it's a red shirt year. Where are they going to play? I'm like, I don't know, 10th pick in the draft. Like, go beat somebody out. Yeah. You know, like, go go show everybody that you belong in the starting lineup. And the guy that they signed, before, you know, to come here to, to be a starter, like, maybe they're the depth player. Who knows? Interesting spot for any young player joining this defense because you mentioned it before today. We've been taping all day. Yeah. Six former first-round picks along that defensive line. Yep. Eight first-round picks in all on this Jets defense. Yes. So for anybody coming in, you are joining a very good defense that has its eyes on being the best. That's true. That's true. Like, they're, they're at least eight deep on the defensive line, probably nine or ten right now. So if you get taken there, all right, well, if you're defense tackle, you watch Quinn and Williams go to work. Yep. You know, you're a defensive end. You watch Hassan Reddick, Jermaine Johnson. We've seen Jermaine really evolve in, in just two years right now. You watch Will McDonald go out there and compete for playing time. I mean, you watch these veterans go to work. This is a, a team, not a defense, a team built around their defensive front, yep. their defensive line. If you're a linebacker, what better spot to come uh, than to watch Quincy Williams or C.J. Mosley go to work? Like, both of them are quiet. Both of them are workers. Both of them are practice players. Like you get, if you're a linebacker coming in here and they need depth at linebacker, like come and watch those two guys work. Uh, if you're a corner, I mean, Sauce Gardner is the first one on the field every day. You know, like you know, you you want to go become Sauce Gardner, go watch Sauce Gardner work. Yeah. 
Uh, go watch him work against Garrett Wilson. Go watch him go to work uh, in every drill. And then if you're a safety, there's there's a chance to you can make this roster as a safety. But Chuck Clark has been a proven player in this league. Tony Adams was a playmaker last year. Um, you know, go learn from those guys. Learn what the standard is. Create the new standard here in New York. You know all the Eagles so well. Hassan Reddick. Man, that was a surprise for me. If you would have told me in January the Jets are going to get Hassan Reddick, I wouldn't have believed you. What is maybe the most under-the-radar quality that he brings to this team? Oh, he plays with max effort. He plays with max effort. There's no, there's no one player. There's no one scheme that can really just flat out stop him. Like there's no, I mean, he went up against Lane Johnson every day in practice. Jordan Mulata. He went up against elite players in Philadelphia. I was part of a, a, a you know, a defense line that had 70 sacks that got all the way to a Super Bowl and within 30 minutes of winning a Super Bowl, and they were led by their defensive front. Hmm. Uh, Hassan is an every down player. He's going to play 75 percent of the snaps. He's been largely healthy throughout his career. Um, he was also humbled early in his career. He was the 13th pick in the draft mm -hmm. at a Temple, and really. They, they played him at off the ball inside linebacker in Arizona when he first started, and he was really out of position. And so, you know, he was humbled. He wasn't talked about. He wasn't putting up any kind of numbers. You know, it, he was labeled a draft bust. Yep. He got humbled early. He went to Carolina in free agency. You know, like he started building his resume late. You know, the last two years of Philly, three years of Philly, he's been very good. So, look, he's a local prospect. You know, he's from – uh, Camden, New Jersey, Haddonfield, New Jersey. And, um, you know, Temple, uh, he got hurt at uh, Haddon Township High School. His senior year broke his ankle, I think. Didn't get recruited. Matt Rule brought him into Temple. I think he was a one- or two-star athlete. So he's always been a little bit humbled. Yeah. So he's always, all right, he's undersized. He's this, he's that. Like, he's going to go prove everybody wrong. And – Look, he, he's looking for a contract. He's yeah. looking for another contract. Now, he's got a, he got a big one from Philly, but he's still looking for another contract. And he's young enough and healthy enough that he can get another one. And a good year here, he could play himself into another big contract. I think Hassan Ruddick is a match for any system, but specifically, what do you think about the match with what Robert Sala and Jeff Albrecht are doing in this well, defensive can, line? Well, I think uh, you, know, it, you can line him up at left defensive end, and he's just fine. All right, he's, uh, he's got enough quickness to beat the big power run blockers out there and know how to you know, play the edge, <clears throat> get penetration, all that stuff. He's excellent on twist stunts. You know, you want to run him on stunts the way the Jets like to run stunts with their front four? He's excellent at it, really understands it. And then, you know, I, I nicknamed him um, in Philly a couple years ago, Freddy Krueger. <laughs> like when he turns the corner now, there's a claw yeah. that's coming out, uh, you know, for the quarterback. Like, he's, he, he enjoys hunting quarterbacks. I mean, 15 and a half sacks over the course of the last four seasons. But to your point about the claw, I think 15 forced fumbles the last four seasons, 13 strip well, sacks. Well, just two Link years ago, if you count the postseason, EA, he had 19 and a half sacks and six forced fumbles. Like, if I was to say to this Jets defense, if you said, what would you say to the Jets defense, Baldi? I'd say takeaways. Like, yep. They, they improved last year, but takeaways. Ball's on the ground. It's got to be your ball. But get the ball on the ground. It starts with forced fumbles. It starts with tip balls. You know, you get your hands on the ball, sauce garter, come down with the ball. You know, like, they need to take the ball away. The, the elite defenses in this league, take it away. Well, offensively, how big of a jump do the Jets have to have to get to where they want to be? Because, you know, this defense is going to be at the, well, they at were, the very – <laughs> Very least, very good. Yeah. Well, I mean, we saw last year. Look, if you don't score points, I don't care how good your defense yep. is. They're going to they're going to get worn down. You're going to be on the field too much. Too much is going to be asked of you. You're going to be trying to do too much, trying to score, knowing the offense. You know, they threw 11 passing touchdowns last year. Yeah, like you know, it's the lowest in the league. So, what's to be asked of the offense? Well, you got to pull your weight. You know, they're putting a lot of resources into the offense. Obviously. Aaron's Aaron, you know, and he's going to be as demanding as anybody the way that we saw throughout the offseason, preseason last year. <clears throat> but, you know, this is a group a largely of a lot of new pieces. Yeah. You got new offensive linemen. OK, you've got a new wide receiver. Uh, the quarterback is going to, you know, come back and who knows what they draft. 
So you you know you got to come together quickly. All right, you, the new you know Mike Williams has to fit in. If they draft a tight end, another wide receiver. All right, what's going to be the role? How how is this thing going to build chemistry? Where okay, third down in, in, in eleven. What are we doing? What's the play? Where are we going? Like so, you got to put a lot of new pieces together. Do you like the position at number ten overall in terms of potentially what Joe Douglas could be looking at? Well, I, you know they 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 signed Tyrod Taylor, so they're not going to be in the quarterback market at yep. ten. Uh, th- this is going to be quarterback heavy at the top. Mm. It's a good year to be sitting at ten because you might see four, maybe five quarterbacks taken in front of them. So it's going to push a lot of elite players, offensive linemen, receivers. Like you're going to push some elite players down to you. So you're going to have a choice at a premium player at a variety of positions at 10. If you want to maximize the pick, you might field phone calls from people that are trying to get to 10 or higher. So you could be in a position where you could acquire picks and still good players, or you could take an elite player knowing you don't have a second round pick. And so you have a lot of flexibility with that pick right now. One guy you just broke down for us, film breakdown, and you also talked to Caroline about this, is Olu Fashionu from Penn State. Mm-hmm. You really like his yeah. potential. I do. Uh, you know, I remember last year during the draft, and I was saying if Olu came out of the draft last year, he might be a top 15 pick. Like he, the fact that he stayed, got another year, um, you know, another year of just core strength, strength, all that stuff with a with a natural big body, natural big, strong, powerful body. Um, there's very little not to like about him. He's a great person. He's been a healthy, steady performer. I think he's just gotten better. I think he understands the game. He understands what left tackle is. It's a position almost all by itself um, sometimes. Like you're just out there on the island against elite pass rushers. And your job is to keep that guy off your quarterback. He understands the mentality that it takes, but I think he's a worker. And I think he's got a lot of good technique that he's learned along the way. But I just as honestly, he reminded me right now of when Tyron Smith came out of USC. Like that was my, when I've watched him play, that was my comp. And it's funny, they, who knows, maybe they could be teammates here. That would be something else. And, how about that education? If you came here and Tyron Smith is already in the locker Well, I mean, Tyron Smith has just had um, – he's just had these vice grips. You know, when he got his hands on you, like you couldn't get his hands off you. And it's still the same way. And then the the best thing about Tyron, um, and I think you could say the same thing about Olu, is they don't play with a clock in their head. Some of these tackles in this draft, albeit they, they might think they're elite, they might be talked about like they're elite, like, I see him giving up on the play too soon. Yeah. And he doesn't have that mentality. Like, the ball's gone, and he still has his grips in, guys. Um, you know, and he, he knows how to marry his feet with his hands. I like the fact that he, uh, that he carries his hands low and he lifts up. Lane Johnson plays like that. Jordan Malata plays like that. It's kind of a new thing in this league. Um, but I like that because it, it, I think you can more quickly stop a guy's power and charge doing that. You don't envision any scenario where Joe Alt is there at 10, right? If you I, like if you're in the Joe Alt business, you would have to go up, correct? Yeah, I think he's the number one guy because he, he might not become the best pros, the the best player at offensive tackle. I think he's very ready right now. Yeah. He's a he's 6 foot 8 and change and he's a master technician. His dad played this, the position at a high level in Kansas City. My brother was his dad's teammate in Kansas City. I felt like I've known John, his dad, forever since my brother was in Kansas City. But I think, like, it, like for example, the Chargers pick number five. So Jim Harbaugh recruited him like crazy coming out of Minnesota. And he wanted him to come to Michigan. And he wanted to go to Notre Dame. So Notre Dame won the battle. Maybe Jim Harbaugh... <laughs> You know, in this draft says, all right, I lost at you in college. I'm not losing you here in the NFL. Like, you can make the case for Joe to go to the Chargers. You can make the case for Joe to go to Tennessee. But it does – but there is some of this upside that some of these other guys have that might be higher than Joe. Because I, when I watch Joe, 
honestly, he reminds me of when Joe Thomas came out of Wisconsin. Mm. Like, Joe Thomas was never the best athlete, although he, although he was athletic enough. He was never the strongest, although he was strong enough. What made Joe Joe was, A, he didn't miss any games, okay? Ten straight years every play. And he was a master technician. He was a shot putter in high school. He had this shot put stance of his. He would fly out of his stance. Like, he was a tactician. And I feel like Joe is like, I'm not saying he's going to be Joe Thomas. I don't know. That's a lot to ask. But, you know, he's a tactician like Joe was. And so you've said as many as eight could go in the first round. And you just mentioned upside before. Just give me a couple names. We've talked about Olu. But as far as tackles that you think have intriguing upside. Well, I mean, Taliese Fuaga of Oregon State is a very powerful, talented player. Yep. Now, he he might be one, two, or three, or four off the board, depending on how you want to stack them. I think everybody looks at something different. But he's got elite run power game. You watch him against the elite pass rushers in college. He didn't have any issue with him. If you want to take a guy that has immense possibilities, there's a Marius Mims at Georgia. He's six foot eight. He's 345 pounds. He moves exceptionally well. Mm. He's only started eight games. Now, yeah. he's not because of injuries. I mean, they rotate players. He has missed some time. But he's a guy that if he really wants to be great and he gets good coaching, that combination, he might be better than all of them in this draft. Could these three guys at the receiver position all hit and be super players at the next level? And I'm talking about Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., and Rome Adunze. So I think they can. History says that if they get taken in any order of one, two, three, that not all three are going to be right. great. Yeah. I mean, that's what history says. You go back to the 2014 draft, and you know, and there was a lot of great receivers. You know, Mike Evans was in that draft. Odell was in that draft. Devontae Adams was the eighth receiver taken. Crazy. He might be the best of all of them. Yeah. Um, so the history says that Marvin – uh, you know, Malik, along with Rome, they're not all three going to be great. Mm -hmm. it's, that's what history says. Sometimes yeah. you go to the wrong place, bad quarterback, changing the guards, like you just get caught up. So, um, but I, I don't know which one might not be the guy. I have a feeling like my own, own gut tells me that Rome is going to be the best of all of them. Wow. Yeah. So both you and Leger Doosable, who we've been with today, yeah. very high on Rome. It's intriguing because for months, even back to the regular season, people have been looking at the Jets and saying tackle or receiver. Mm -hmm. Do you think ultimately this is where it's going to land? Because the other guy hanging out there that fans are very interested in, that you've taped multiple segments on today, Brock Bowers from Georgia. Okay. <laughs> well, um, History says that you can get elite tight ends outside of the top 10. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Travis Kelsey, if you look at George Kittle, if you look at Mark Andrews, <clears throat> none of them were even anywhere close to the top 10. Right. But if you look at Kyle Pitts, I mean, maybe they haven't figured out how to use him in Atlanta, but he hasn't made a difference. Um, now, that, now, every player deserves their own – status yeah. and creating their own legacy. But there is something to trends. There yeah. is trends that says, boy, that's those guys, <laughs> Vernon Davis, you know, those guys taking the top 10, they don't, they don't become top 10 players. I just think this, Brock Bowers is in that conversation. Um, he's a much better blocker than anybody thinks he is. They might not give him credit for it. They just don't think he's a great blocker because they watch him catching passes all the time and they see him scoring points. But you have to have a plan to use him. Like, there's no sense in taking a top 10 player if you don't have a real plan to get maximum value from him. So generally, if you look at Mark Andrews in Baltimore or Kelsey, those guys are elite um, players within the scheme. They're the number one red zone option. You know, like Mike Evans was a 10th receiver taken. Like, those guys are the go-to guys. Now, George Kittle's not the go-to guy, but he was the fifth-round pick. 
and he's got Ayuk, and he's got McCaffrey, and he's got Debo. Mm. So he doesn't have to be. But for a long time, Mark Andrews had to be the number one target. And he was for Lamar. And Kelsey, despite all the changes that have taken place at the receiver position, the offense still runs through him. So you've got to have that type of a, a plan for Brock, I think, to, to get the max out of him. Seven overall picks in this class for the Jets. Mm-hmm. No second rounder. Um, when you go into the draft and you're the GM and you're Joe Douglas and you look at this roster, how important is it for you to get a second back at some point? Well, I think that if you looked at Joe's board, yep. I, I would highly doubt that he has awarded 32 first-round picks. I'll bet he's somewhere around 24 to 26 first-round picks. Okay? So Probably even lower than that. Maybe even lower yeah. than that. In some years, it is lower, yeah. EA, for sure. Because in any draft, you go back and post-draft these guys, there's going to be 8 to 10 busts in every draft. You just don't know where they're going to be or who they're going to be. Sometimes it's injuries. Sometimes it's just that the player, the person, the, you know, where they go. But regardless, the, the, the reason why I, I made that suggestion is because when you have 24 first-round picks, you've got a deep second round. You mm-hmm. got really good second round picks. There's going to be good running backs taking the second. You're going to get good receivers taking the second round. You're going to get a lot of these offensive tackles drop to the second round. Um, you're going to get good offensive guards and maybe a center or two in the second round. So you could you could find good offensive positions. Now the Jets don't aren't looking at a center, probably not looking at a guard, but you know tackles, receivers. There's going to be good players there in the second round. I wanted to ask you about uh, the changing face of the AFC East right now. The Bills have won the division four consecutive years. Yep. We saw them most recently trade Stephon Diggs Mm -hmm. to the Houston Texans. So Josh Allen's number one weapon of years past won't be there anymore. Saw some cost-cutting moves Mm -hmm. there in Buffalo. who also have a new center. Gabe Davis signed in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. Those safeties that yeah, yeah, Poyer Hyde, mm-hmm. Trey Davis White, who was hurt the last couple of years. He signs with the Rams. He talk. Then we moved to Miami. In each of Mike Dan- uh, Mike McDaniel's first two years, they mm-hmm. make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Very explosive offense. Mm-hmm. Questions for me along that offensive line. New defensive coordinator mm-hmm. Christian Wilkins is elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Van Ginkle, for my money, was. One of the most underrated players in the league last year. He's all over he's the followed, place. He followed Brian Flores to Minnesota. Yeah, he's out. Xavier, Manny Ogba's out. Xavier Howard's Jaylen, out. Jalen yeah. Phillips is coming back from a torn Achilles right. Black it, Friday. It, Bradley Chubb is coming back. There you go. You're hitting a, you're hitting a nail right now. Then you got New England, who is in major reconstruction mode mm-hmm. right now. It's wide open. It's wide open. It's it's it's, it's literally anything like. The Jets' number one priority is to win the division. Yeah. It's wide open. There's not a team that's better than them, at least on paper and talking here in April, EA. There's not a, a better team on paper than the Jets are right now. Uh, the Miami can, will put a, an explosive offense together. Yeah, you know, if those guys all stay healthy, which they couldn't do last year, none of them, Tyreek, Jalen, you know, Raheem, yep. uh, Devon, Achan, like none of those guys stayed healthy for the full year. But if they do, like – I mean, they're they're an explosive offense. But defensively, Anthony Weaver comes in for Vic Fangio. Like, I feel – and I think Anthony Weaver's a good coordinator. I think he's going to be a good coach there. But they they lost a lot. They lost a lot. They they actually somehow, with the least amount of money to spend in free agency, they filled some linebacker spots. They filled a safety spot. They filled some spots. But they don't look like they're going to be a top-20 defense in this league right now. That's going to be hard to win if you're not a top-20 defense in the NFL. Period. Yeah, I mean, if the Jets and the, be, and the Bills are going to put a lot on Josh Allen's shoulders, and when they put a lot on his shoulders, now look, they, they their offense changed when Ken Dorsey got fired, and Joe Brady got elevated. Their offense changed; they became a run first offense, uh, and Josh was a big part of that with James Cook, and they were good at it. That's what got them to the playoffs and won the division last year, um, and won a playoff game against Pittsburgh. But uh, I don't think. They're the team to beat right now. Now, they might strike gold in the draft and get themselves an elite receiver that really, you know, complements Dalton Kincaid and what they have there. But you don't you don't know right now. So let's get out of here with this. The wide receiver class, we talked about the top three, Brian, Thompson, uh, Brian Thomas. I think there's gaining consensus out there that he's probably 
the next guy mm-hmm. after these three. How much does it weigh into your decision making if you're the GM that this is a really good class up top, but it extends? I don't know if these guys have the star qualities that the top three or top four have, but there are productive guys that are going to come out of the third round or the fourth round here, and we've seen it very recently well, and it never cool. stops. Yeah, well, I mean, right. Puka was a fifth-round pick. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you look at Ricky Pearsall, you know, at Florida, there's nobody that doesn't think he's going to be a great player. Like, he reminds you of Julian Edelman, just how tough he is and the type of routes that he runs. He always looks like he's open. I interviewed him last week, and I, I started, like, you're always open. You run these deep over routes. Like, nobody in the SEC could cover you. Um, Lad McGonkey is yeah. a guy. You know, Keon Coleman. I mean, there's a lot of guys out there. Every team has – every college team has got, you know, two, three, four receivers on every single play that are out there on the field. So there's a lot to choose from. And then, you you know, so while there might be a top tier after, you know, Marvin, say Brian Thomas at LSU, whatever, Xavier Worthy maybe at, you know, Texas, yep. there might be a top tier of guys. Um, you know, Devontae Adams was the eighth receiver taken. You know, and they said, you know, he ran a slow 40 time and look what he's done. Like he's just a professional, you know, and he's got elite releases and he understands the game and he's tough and he's big. So you're going to find these guys, you know, deep into the draft, the way the Rams found Puka, the way they, they found Cooper Cup years ago, you know, in the middle rounds. Like there's guys out there that will compete with these guys at the very top that we're talking about. So I got some breaking news right now. I'm hearing that Baldy's going to be at uh, One Jets Drive draft oh, weekend, huh? I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean we got to we got to have a draft party. We got to put a uh, a missing component to this team. That sounds good, brother. Yeah. So I, I, I'm no look. Draft night is a special night, you know, in our country and in this league. <laughs> it always is, and that's Brian Baldinger who went undrafted yeah. and played 12 years in the National Football League and still breaking it down as yes, good sir. as anybody. Yep. Still fooling them. <laughs>